How are you today, Chris? And Unmute. I, Unmute. And I am still here too. So is it working? Yes. Yeah, well, I'm seeing, I'm now seeing levels. So there we go. Okay. Do you want to start over then? Yeah, yeah. we're going to have to. So we'll just have to recreate that. So now we've lost six minutes. Do the, like I literally said, when this all goes south, I'm the one <clears> to blame. So, but it was Christopher the engineer, not Christopher the host that screwed it up. So welcome. There we go. <laughs> welcome to Connect This. So. Thanks for thanks. I'd like to thank the chat room for waiting five minutes to tell me that they are watching my mouth move. Without <laughs> I'm Christopher Mitchell at the Institute for Local Self Reliance. I'm the one to blame when this all goes south again. And uh, we're going to welcome on my my panel, Doug Dawson, who is with CCG Consulting. Uh, Doug, do you want to reintroduce yourself, please? Yeah, so we're a general telecom consulting firm, over a thousand clients, and I write the blog Pots and Pans by CCG. Please check us out. So. Which is literally Pots and Pans by CCG.com. So, yes. uh, yeah, and I, I, I like the mailing list option. You know, every week, um, Doug emails me his weekly columns. I'm sure it takes a long time to do that for everyone. Oh, so. it does. It's terrible. <laughs> Appreciate Hold that. on. You don't get them every morning? <laughs> no, I... That's, that, that, I read them every day, so... Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> So we also have uh, Monica Webb. Monica, um, you spend a lot of time organizing communities in Western Massachusetts uh, who are right now getting fiber um, through a municipal approaches, local approaches. Uh, and then for many years uh, since then, you've been working with Ting, a local company. Well, I should say a company that has that local ethos, provides really great service, great customer service uh, around the country. Uh, you also are my, my wireless provider, so I appreciate that. Uh, but just tell us a little bit about yourself and Ting. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, Ting is an uh, an ISP, a fiber ISP in uh, about 10, 10 plus cities across the U.S. Uh, we really pride ourselves in doing right by customers, doing right by municipalities, having good relationships with them. And I like to say that I've I've worn both hats, both the private sector hat, as well as, as you mentioned, fighting tirelessly for municipalities that were for many years underserved and unserved by any kind of decent broadband to get that. So I very much approach my relationships with municipalities and our customers, understanding the concerns, uh, both from the provider side and from the user side. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. We also have here. Travis Carter, who is our returning champion from us internet. Uh, Travis, what's, what's with us internet? Why didn't you go with we internet? Well, we went with U.S. because we thought we wanted to be real big, and we ended up serving Minneapolis and so, and a couple of the suburbs. But yes, thank you for inviting me back to the second episode of the show here. Yes, so, the second episode, episode one, because we are yes. geeks. Um, so I wanted to start with Starlink, and um, now that we have both audio and video, uh, let's talk about Starlink. And uh, there's been some news. We see some pricing. I got uh, the lowdown today from some folks who gave me a nice briefing uh, that answered some of the questions I've long have, uh, I've long had. But uh, Doug, I feel like I've talked with you about this the most. And so uh, for folks, like, how do you describe Starlink to someone who just says, "What is Starlink?" Well, Starlink is, is currently launched. I think it's 860 satellites. Uh, they're going to launch a minimum of 3,000 with plans for 30,000 more, supposedly. It's Elon Musk's company. Uh, so far, he's raised two and a half, I guess now three and a half billion. Of, he needs 10 billion more, according to uh, according to uh, Forbes. So we don't, you know, we don't know that he's going to uh, raise his money to build this or not. He's also in a race with Jeff Bezos, who can actually self-fund his network, so he might beat him to the punch. Uh, so he's going to be doing a, a similar. So it's it's a the satellites go over your head. There's a ton of them. They last up in the sky about 90 minutes over your house, and of course, before they go, another one has to come into your horizon, and and there has to be more than that because of hills and stuff around people's horizons. So, so they have to be about 60 minutes apart and they have to be a whole lot of layers north and south, you know, so because they don't re because they're not very high at about 200 miles, they don't see very far. So there's, you know, there's just going to be circle, 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 circle of these running around the earth. Um, supposedly they're going to deliver, and I'd like to hear your update today, 50 to 150 megabits in the current uh, configuration for 99 bucks is the price they're talking about. Their biggest limitations are 
they, right now they have about a million licenses for the U.S. And of course, there's at least 14 million homes with no broadband. And, and I don't know that they're going to get too many more licenses. It's a bandwidth issue. And their biggest limitation is, is the big pipe to bring all that traffic up and down to the earth at, at base stations. That's going to that's going to be their bottleneck. So. Well, that's that's a lot. I appreciate that. That's yes. a really good roundup. I'm um, one of the things I wanted to get from Travis and Monica was a sense of, um, you know, they say they're not they're not going to be going into cities, um, but you both are familiar with these different business models and things like that. Um, what are you thinking about Starlink? Are you impressed with what you're seeing, or uh, um, what are your thoughts on it? Well, what I would say, you know, having. <laughs> Having lived with one of the uh, other larger satellite providers for many years and trying to work on that, uh, I think it fills a niche for remote mm. areas uh, of you know a, a better service provision. Do I think they'll be able to go into cities? No, just because I know enough about the technology. You know, as Doug was mentioning, they're really limited by bandwidth, particularly bandwidth as it pertains to density of potential customers in a, in mm -hmm. an area. So I really think that the niche is going to be areas that that are more remote. My only concern would be I, I, I wouldn't want it to displace, you know, a, a rural community like the one I lived in doing, you know, doing the ultimate solution of fiber. So that would be, you know, the, the only thing if they if if they do what other satellite providers have done, which is typically get people into long term contracts and and mm -hmm. uh, and make it difficult to break out of that. That would be unfortunate. But and, you know, the bottom line is there needed to be something for a lot of these rural customers that had no other option but these, you know, very asymmetrical, low bandwidth, unreliable options from the outer orbit satellites as opposed to the lower orbit. Yes. And I, I think I've just phrased that unclear, which is something that I plan on doing a lot in this show. Um, I, yeah, I agree with you. They're not they're definitely not going after the city stuff. But Travis, you're hanging out in the. Um, in the uh, the user groups and things like that, trying to get a sense of what's going on. You know, my impression. Uh, I talked today actually separately with with um, with some people who are on uh, on it in Washington State, um, and it sounds like it's definitely better than DSL, like way better than DSL. It's not as good as cable yet, uh, but they're really happy with it in those areas. What are you seeing from the forums that you're reading? Well, I think it's um, fairly apparent that each satellite that's overhead has at least one or two users on it. And as we all know, with any wireless technology, that should work fairly well. The real, the real question is going to be is if there's 100, 200, 300 users in that footprint of that satellite. Now, somebody who's been traveling around the country with LTE only as an option, I would put this in between, you know, LTE and you know, low level McDonald's style Wi-Fi being at the bottom. And this Starlink would be a good interim option. And then, but nothing, nothing will replace the benefit, speed, reliability, cost, user experience of a proper fiber connection to the internet. Yes, I mean, I'm I'm there with you both. I, I really want to see the community networks. I, I'm excited about something Doug's been talking about for a while, this idea of Starlink as wholesale uh, so that a community network may not have to deal with the backhaul. They could build a local network and distribute that Starlink signal around. Um, but Doug, I'm curious about something. You mentioned Bezos. I was in talking today with my team, um, you know, the the connection from from, say, Tokyo to New York City, um, in theory, will be the fastest. It'll be way faster than than fiber optics. It'll be faster than wireless to go through space. I have to assume that the first company to be there is going to make a ton on the trading and 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 that sort of thing. And so won't won't Starlink win quite a bit just by being the first one to be able to offer that? No, they won't because there's three or four satellite providers who are just building space backhaul networks. Okay. Starlink is using very cheap electronics. I mean, they're the kind of electronics Travis wouldn't would laugh at if you tried to put them in his data center. And they're doing that on purpose because they only last in the sky about three years. Some people are putting up very expensive satellites to do the Tokyo to New York mm -hmm. beaming. And they're, and they're, they're going to be fast, reliable, and they're going to be there for a long time. And so they're building the true wholesale networks. And you don't hear much about them because that's all they plan to do. And so those, those guys are going to get all that business because that will be the difference between a mom and pop ISP and, and a true big backhaul provider. I mean, they're going to be the the uh the level three of the sky basically so yeah okay well i'm excited i mean i have to say that when i'm seeing 
suggest that this is going to be good in the short term. Um, I'm worried about the longer term repercussions on more local solutions. I'm worried about money coming out of the community. I'm I'm worried about there being basically a space monopoly eventually if uh, if um, all these different systems just get purchased by the same company. Um, right. And so, and but the thing that I was most worried about, which I'm really curious if if anyone has any thoughts on this, I was worried that we would see the ability of these satellites to cover, like say, all of northern Wisconsin, because my impression from talking to people earlier on about the electronics was that they would be able to sign up people in northern Wisconsin. But if everyone in northern Wisconsin wanted to sign up, even though it's low density, it's still enough people in those areas that they may not be able to connect them all and there would be waiting lists. And it sounds to me like in talking to them, they are not anticipating that. Travis put his finger on it because consider one of these the same as a point to point wire, point to multi point wireless sitting on an antenna out in the rural area. It, those things can max out at about 150 or 200 customers. And beyond that, it just falls apart. These are probably less customers than that from a given satellite at a given time. And so if they overload them, we're going to be seeing 15 megabit speeds and or crashes and or brownouts. So they're not, they're not, their model is not to do that. That's one reason they're pricing at $99. They don't want everybody. They can't begin to serve everybody. Uh, and, and they're not, they're not going to now, when he says he's going to launch 30,000 more satellites, maybe he does plan to do that. But he'll, you know, when there's six of them at the sky at the same time, then he's got something, right? So mm -hmm. I, that's a lot of satellites. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is. That, and I, they address that when I talked to them. They were saying, you know, it's it's a lot of satellites, but they're pretty small. And there's a lot of space up there. I mean, that's why they yeah. use that term for it, I think. Yeah, but, but how are they planning on getting that bandwidth back down to Earth? That's the that, problem. It's the backhaul. Freaking the backhaul. lasers. Yeah. Right. Not not down to earth. <laughs> no, I know, but I yeah. shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't know how Ting does, but, you know, our metric is 50,000 subscribers is going to run you about 200 gigabits of backhaul traffic. And they can't so, do that here. So, that, yeah. so, that, so that's the metric. And so if you have 50,000 users in northern Wisconsin and they have 40 megahertz of capacity to bring up and down the signal, right. oh, they're, ab they're about, uh, what, 190 megahertz? gigabit short right of the, of the backhaul traffic so, so but, but aren't I, they aren't they going to be able to build more of those i mean it just seems to me like the, why i don't understand the constraint there why wouldn't they build more of those well they're going to have to build more well, earth they're, stations they're, but they're expensive yeah. and those earth stations have to be connected on the ground with fiber then so yeah. it, it's it's more of a challenge than it sounds like mm -hmm. and then they're not and they may be planning that but they haven't talked about that they've really ignored backhaul because they know that's their weak point and they're just not talking about it. I also want to tell you that we're pro it's very possible as we talk negative about them that you're going to get undated by the Elon Musk heads. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote a blog yeah. about them and got 40,000 bad comments. Oh, in yeah. day. Wow. <laughs> I, I cannot stand how people just obsess over this man. Um, you know, I think, I think he's really innovative. I don't understand why people are so cold or so hot on him. And it just, it's beyond me, but I think we can, I want to move on to another technology of the future. And that is cable. <laughs> so <laughs> I've, I've been getting these questions that I felt like I want to ask you first, Monica. Um, no, I got a question from someone, which is really good, which is sort of like, what is the future of the cable network? And, and so I just want to have a sense, you know, Monica, your company, like, I think is built on the idea that there's going to be a lot of room for improvement, better technology. You're using fiber optics, you're competing against mm -hmm. cable companies in which I'm sure you feel that you have a number of edges. What do you think the future of cable is in terms of like, at what point will you not be competing against cable anymore? How do you think about that? Well, you know, fundamentally right now we have a, where we, where we do compete against cable, we have a phenomenally superior product and far better customer experience, uh, you know, from first phone call to service and delivery and support. And so once people are on that product and, and receive our service, they're really going to be very loyal because it's going to be a very different experience than what they've had before. You know, we sometimes refer to it as like the PS, the, the PTSD that people have from incumbents, they sort of can't believe initially how great we are and it's they're waiting for the other shoe to drop and it never does so i would say you know right now we don't you know they'll go out and say oh we can do a gigabit too it, you know they, they they don't say oh it's highly asymmetrical or um you know it might not actually be quite a gigabit or whatever but 
you know, they're, they're competing right now with us on messaging and on, you know, occasionally on short-term pricing. So that's really, you know, where we have to clarify our offering versus their offering currently, I would say long-term, you know, we believe that long-term they're going to have to go to fiber, but you know, they're putting that off as long as they can. So at some point we'll have an equivalent playing field in terms of product, but you know, we'll already have those customers and they will have already had a better customer experience with us. And so, you know, we're, we're less concerned about that down the road. Um, and I don't know that they will ever be able to compete on a customer experience playing field. Does it even, I mean, does it, when you're thinking about making plans internally, tell us all your secrets. <laughs> you know, um, um, so Charter just raised rates again today um, on, on customers. And is that, is that a bigger deal than the actual technology? Is it their bad customer service and their pricing? Or does the, is the technology even matter really what you're competing against? You know, technology matters to people like us. Uh, you know, the early adopters are like, oh, yeah, you got to have fiber, got to fiber. And when you explain to people why it's better, and certainly the pandemic illustrated, we had a lot of people on cable footprints who, you know, came crying to us like, please, we just can't, we can't operate effectively. We can't manage the city from our homes. We can't manage mm -hmm. my business from the homes. Uh, and that was cable, as much as cable like to say, oh, we were okay in the pandemic. Not, not, not that's not what we heard. Um, but, you know, we've literally had community meetings where we go into a new town and we say we're going to have a meeting and talk about who Ting is and, what, you know, why fiber is different. And people have stood up and said, I don't even care about the product. I just can't get a wait to get away from insert incumbent name. And mm -hmm. the entire audience there of 75 people has gotten up and cheered. <laughs> so, I mean, the um, the incumbents, I mean, it's whether it's, you know, raising rates without, you know, for no justification, uh, what, you know, and, and, and without, without telling people whether it's, you know, invisible contract rollovers, whether it's just generally being unhelpful and unsupportive. Uh, there are a myriad of reasons of why people don't like the incumbents. Um, and, and I just, you know, I know there's, they talk about trying to fix those problems. I just mm -hmm. don't know if it's in their culture to really permeate through to being a better company that way. Yeah, Travis, I, I know you're, a, you love ethernet more than life itself. Uh, so, um, you know, questions about Doxis, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get um, you up too upset talking about other technologies. Uh, but what are your thoughts in terms of this? I mean, you compete against Comcast. Comcast is yeah. one of the most aggressive in the cable upgrades. I, I think the reality that is moving forward is cable will be the dominant technology wherever fiber is not. So if you look at it as a, across the country, uh, companies like Tang and us and other smaller providers can go in and clean up. But if you take markets where there is no third option, you know, with effectively DSL dead at this point, you're gonna, it's gonna be predominantly cable. People will always try to glom on to the new hot buzzword. Uh, for a while, we heard about 5G forever. Uh, now we're going to hear about Starlink for the next year. Oh, then uh, 5G is not then, gone. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> oh, well, then they're going to throw out some 6G. Then we'll make it a 7G, you know. But wherever fiber is, it will, at least in my opinion, especially what, what people I don't think appreciate at this point is is the marrying of fi fiber with Wi-Fi 6E, which is, uh, you know, 1,000 megahertz channels. Uh, with the FCC opened up in the six gigahertz band, it's going to uh, this time next year, it's going to revolutionize those gigabit connections. Multi gig is coming out two and a half gig to the home. Wait, but, so, so let me just push anyway, you on so, that. so, so, so yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, Doxis four, Doxis symmetrical, Doxis full duplex. I think these yep, things are yep. all the same thing. They're going to have those same wireless routers and they claim they're going to be delivering that yep. same sort of, I mean, so, so you actually, I mean, I think you'll have a reliability edge, and and I'll come to Doug for more technical discussion yeah. in a second on this. But um, but uh, you're going to be competing against someone that can finally offer real uploads now against you in the same wireless technology. I think. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, the the reality is is the way that you know I think Monica said it best is you know it's at the end of the day if you're not the incumbent CLEC or you're not the incumbent cable company. You have a you get thirty five percent of the market just by knocking on people's doors. People are tired of playing the pricing game and the what I forget what you call it, the invisible rate increase. That's a fabulous term, you know, and that's literally what it is. 
So all you have to do is, if, is be an alternate fiber or provider, walk down the street, and you can get a third of the market instantly. Well, we're going to be talking about that in a couple minutes because that's yeah. sort of the okay. that's why we we brought this team together to, to yeah. talk about it. Uh, so, Doug, what are what are your thoughts on this discussion so far? Well, you know, let's not get too carried away about the cable companies getting better. So, Doxus Four was just announced three weeks ago. It's probably going to be two and a half years before we see any of the gear from that. All the all the CTOs of all the cable companies have been interviewed. They don't see it working into their networks probably for a decade. Really? And so, th so they're not going to be rushing to do the upgrades. And so, because they're expensive, they just finished their upgrade to three point one. You know, these are these cable companies of the whole industry are the most bottom line driven, you know, quarterly earnings companies in the industry, and they are simply not going to spend capital until they're starting to lose market share. And Travis already said it. In ninety percent of the markets, they're going to be the only player. They're going to continue to grow it torrid paces as DSL dies. And so they're simply not all that worried about fiber at this point. You know, so we're not going to see, I mean, today the upload speeds are their big downfall. And that's what people hate about this working from home during COVID. You know, the, currently most of the cable networks in the country use from five to 42 uh, megahertz on the beginning of their spectrum band. That's the crap that used to be channels two through five in the old days of antennas. And if you remember, if you had channel three or four on your TV and your mom ran the microwave, you lost the picture. <laughs> well, that's exactly what happens with their upload. They've used the worst piece of spectrum in their system to do the upload because no one cared about upload. Well, they can't move it. That's hardwired into DOCSIS 3.0. And so their only choices are, there are two higher bands that they could upgrade to. Those are very expensive. When just to upgrade their systems, they have to go out in the field and tear out all the power taps. And I mean, they, they, a lot of cases, they have to actually replace coax cable. They're, I don't think they're going to make any changes. I mean, I, I we do surveys and we do uh, uh, all around, and speed tests all around the country. I just finished today looking at a, at a market where there was no cable customer in this particular town, a, a pretty nice sized town who had an upload speed over 10 megabit. I mean, 10 megabits per second. They have simply ignored the upload and and they don't have an easy way to fix it. And and I think they're just hoping that honestly, I believe they're hoping that COVID blows over and everybody goes back to the office and they're going to be very upset when they don't. You know, oh, I just yeah. saw a survey the other day that 23 million people are planning to move in the next year in the US, 56% of them plan to work at home. People are not going back to the office. So and, they, Doug, I mean, they, they've got a permanent problem. So I think you keep track of these numbers. So tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a recent Wall Street analysis that I saw suggested that more than 20% of the US, I think, has fiber from one of the big telcos, more or less, um, in that over the next 10 years, it's expected that that could get to 40%. They're not expecting a lot of other investments. So in a lot of places, cable will be the only option. And, and even in areas in which we're getting that big telco fiber, they're freezing at like, not, not freezing, but they're just stalling at a 40% take rate. Um, well, the Wall Street analysts who hire me don't make those stupid claims. I do work for some of them. <laughs> the, fa the fact is Verizon Fios has been around forever. That's the vast majority of those passings. AT&T already built their 12 million passings. CenturyLink is building on a one or 200,000 a year. I don't, how do you get from 20% to 40%? Who are, who's that company who's building that fiber? You're looking at two of them on the screen here. Well, they're not going <laughs> to, they're not building 20% of the market unless Travis makes a whole lot more money than I thought he's making. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know who it is who's going to be doing all that fiber building. They're not out there. I mean, I, I don't know who they, who they think is going to be doing it. It's well, certainly think, not AT&T they got Verizon. a new lease on life. I mean, I think that you're, you're going to see some of it. You're going to see, I mean, Windstream, I believe, is going to go to this, some of their towns that are, you know, the, uh, the uh, county seats. And I think they're going to do some fiber over builds. They just got freshly up. But again, you know, that'll be a half a percent of the market. Mm -hmm. I mean, to get the 40 percent, you know, I wish it was true. Um, but I, I just don't see it. So more you or know. less what you're all saying is that I feel like, uh, we're more or less where we are with cable. You're all expecting yeah. that more or less to continue, and you have your business plans are around that. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, I just, and, and what's what's the incentive for them to change? Mm -hmm. I mean, people complain a little bit, but if it's the only game in town, and you know that that's what's interesting about Starlink. It's another non-symmetrical 
technology as well. You know, I mean, it's it's we just keep permeating these, you know, non-symmetrical systems out there. And I don't know if it's if it's not. No, it's not symmetrical. No, I know that's no. not symmetrical, but it's still pretty good upload. I thought. Um, you know, it's not as. Re- I don't mm. think it's. I don't think it's like. It was know, north of twenty five on the test that I saw. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't hard. It wasn't as bad as cable. Yeah. Right, because I mean, I'm looking at you know one thousand supposedly um, down. I don't even bother checking that, but I get forty up, and so that's uh, you know, that's a twenty x roughly. So. Yeah. Um. The um, so the topic that we really wanted to spend more time on this is working out fairly well. We'll 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 finish with a brief discussion on elections, but but what I brought you here to talk more about was why we're not seeing more of these small companies. I mean, it seems pretty clear people hate the cable companies. Um, Travis says that you know a blind guy walking down the street can sign up a third of the people on that street to get a fiber network. Uh, why is this not a you know a simple business case? Um, and you know, Monica, I want to start with you again. Um, um, you know, you've been doing this and you were organizing um, as well. I feel like something is stopping this, right? And let me just actually set one other piece of context, which is that we know that we can go from very few ISPs to what, 7,500, you know, many, many thousands of ISPs in a short period of time when there's an opportunity. Uh, we're not seeing anything like that. And so, uh, what is the real opportunity, Monica? Uh, you know, I, I, I would say that there are, I think when you, when you look around some communities, there are small, you know, where if you're around a strong regional economic center, there are often, there'll often be a, a small fiber ISP that has transitioned from being, you know, from being a reseller of, uh, you know, of incumbent services, of DSL and, and T1s. But I would say the bigger issue is it's expensive. So it's access mm-hmm. to capital and the resources to stand up a telecom. Uh, both of those are you know, fairly significant barriers to entry, I think, for companies to get into it. Uh, you know, I look at Ting getting into the business, which was relatively seamless for us because we were a publicly traded company. We had two core businesses that were generating a lot of cash. Uh, that, you know, reliable cash that we were able to then channel into fiber CapEx. Um, And we also had significant resources within the building, um, both software development, which helped us um, with a lot of centralized efficiencies for the business, as well as we had a lot of people with ISP routes and internet routes in the building that we were able to leverage in order to stand up a telecommunications business. So for us, it was was a, a fairly clear path to doing that. I, I think for, you know, many businesses, unlike other businesses that you could get into without a lot of industry background or where it would be easy to borrow money, it's it's not as easy to do that in the ISP space. And Doug, so you, you're you working with a lot of these companies too. Is that, does that seem like- yeah, I, I, help, I help small startup ISPs. I've helped hundreds of them. And the answer to your question is money, money, money. A, a, small, a small startup guy- you know, you might, if you have a lot of equity in your house and you've got lots of relatives who actually would lend you money, you might be able to go build a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of fiber. Well, that's not very much fiber. So it takes forever to build up your business to the point where the banks trust you to where you get to Travis's size, where every year he knows how much money he can borrow. But, but to get to that first five-year hump is incredibly hard. And you have to, you have to personally pledge all of your wealth and and many wives will tell you not to do that anymore. <laughs> um, and so um, and so you know, it's, getting started is almost nearly impossible. Banks do not make those kind of loans. They they don't loan to little guys until you show success. Well, you can't show success till they help you get started. It's the whole catch twenty two. And and so there there's a million little guys who would love to do it. All the guys who used to be dial up ISPs, their hearts in the right place. If they could borrow four million bucks, we'd have seventy five hundred of these guys. They can't borrow four million bucks. They can borrow two hundred thousand dollars. Is that the, do... is that the market misallocating opportunity yeah. though? Do you think do you feel like it would be smart if if you had millions of dollars, would you start lending it to these these folks? I would not, because three quarters of them will fail. The fact is, you know, the problem is you have to be good at everything to start one of these businesses. You have to be good at money and banking. You've got to be good at marketing. You have to be good at customer service. You have to be good at the technology and getting things repaired on time. Most of the guys who want to do this are good at one or two of those things. Mm-hmm. 
they're like really good technicians and they, you know, we know how engineers are. A lot of them, you would not you have let your customers talk to them. <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, so the fact is it's, you know, to be a charismatic sales sort of guy, be technical and be good at customer service, that's a lot to ask for one or two guys in a startup. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to put that company together. Once you get to a certain size, you can hire all those things, but boy, till you get there, it's, it's hard. So does that sound right to you, Travis? Well, we're, we're very similar to Monica. We had two legacy businesses we'd run since 1995. And we still, if we didn't have the EBITDA for that, I never would have been able to borrow the no. initial capital, but we also started slow. We started out with a $250,000 build in our first year and hooked up like a hundred homes, which is what I encourage a lot of the small guys you know, they're just starting out. They all want to get to 50,000 subscribers tomorrow or a hundred thousand subscribers. And I tell them to get to a hundred. Right. And then once they're at a hundred, let's work to 200. And once you get to what I've noticed is when you get to 5,000, now all the government nonsense gets out of your way because people want you. And then it, you just, you just keep building, but you know, your average person isn't going to sit there and say, well, I want to spend 15 years until we can get to really, you know, kind of cooking with gas but it's it's what it takes and um so what we've been trying to do is we've been looking at a few pilot projects where we find you know young energetic people that have some skills and try to give them some of the seed capital to get their communities started and you know get them going you know plant the seed and hopefully assist them along where maybe only i don't know half of them fail but at least you know at least at least we're, we're attempting it and, and there is one other issue. If you get to a certain size, you get gobbled up and purchased. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just saw it happen in Detroit. But the guys purchasing you don't have the same image. They don't have the same vision. And so they're no longer, you know, they're no longer planning to build mm -hmm. every residence in, in Detroit anymore. That vision completely died. They got bought by a company who wants to serve businesses. Was that Rocket Fiber? I don't even know who you're talking yes. about. Yes, yes, Rocket Fiber. They were purchased mm -hmm. and and they're, the guys who purchased them are, an, are a business ISP. It killed the vision. It's, re it's really hard to say no when someone comes and offers you a big check after you've had a company where for the first four years you didn't take a paycheck. You know, I mean, yeah. that, that, that's the problem of the starting out with 100 customers. The first three years, the guy doesn't take a penny. Mm -hmm. You know, most families aren't really appreciative of that. <laughs> and so, I always, I always thought yes. Wisps, Wisps would be the best group to go after yeah. if you could, if you could capitalize them correctly, because they've got an area, they've got some customers, but they're just they're terrified most of them of moving to fiber, and I have yet to figure out why. And and they have that secret. They have some capital coming in they have yeah, cash flow. Yep, they, yep, they, yep. that's a model i like but it's hard to talk one of them into it there are yeah, some of them, there are yeah. some of them doing it but yeah well they're they're just an interesting group because they're more worried about what type of resistor is on the motherboard <laughs> than they are worried about the capital yeah. I, I these guys are crazy I always, i'm like why do you care i had a guy one time who didn't like switches so he was going to write his own switch like it's already it's already been done right move on right <laughs> Yeah, they just don't get it, right? Right. But one of the things that we haven't talked about, so I mean, there's been several limitations that have been brought up. And I, I feel like none of these things come up when you hear policy people talking about it. I mean, I Monica, is that is that your sense? Because you work in the policy world, too. Um, the focus is always on local government restrictions or, um, you know, I, th I, I often think that... Um, Part of the challenge of that success rate maybe is through a lack of inform uh, of enforcement of predatory pricing because it's so hard to to get the customers um, when you have Comcast or Charter willing to just offer deep discounts. Uh, you know, are, but are those issues the local? I know that you have problems with rights of way, Monica, because you tell me secretly. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. There, so you know, a couple issues here. I, but the one thing I do want to I want to go back to is what Doug said about you know the the vision changing when Rocket Fiber sold in Detroit and suddenly it's a back to business ISP, and this is something that you know you go back to universal service or cable franchise agreements as onerous as they are, uh, you know, and I've negotiated a few. They both of those things did an important thing, which is they ensured that everybody within a service a designated service area got service. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing with some of the incumbents who are building fiber is they'll say, "Okay, we're going to cherry pick uh, only Greenfield in this community, mm -hmm. and then we're or we're going to cherry pick only 
you know, those that run along where our back hall is located or the affluent neighborhoods or, you know, you name it, we're going to cherry pick neighborhoods in a community. So let's say we end up serving anywhere between 35 to 55% of the community. Well, suddenly that other, the, the people that are left behind, it's, it, it's a very distressed business model for someone else to come in and serve a patchwork of areas that don't have service. And so I think, you know, that's, that's the one area that I think needs to be improved by local governments is ensuring that when fiber providers come in that you know if, if an area already if, let's just say one neighborhood had service fine you don't have to serve that area but the goal should be to get the first fiber provider that comes in to build a city from a residential standpoint to build to everyone uh you know i i, I know that there's going to be there are going to be a lot of nuances in the execution of that but i think that's important with respect Which, to the right I mean, of way, the, so if I could just, I mean, I, yeah. I, I value that, and I just want to make clear because it's interesting. Travis also has that vision, um, but cities don't have any ability to compel that, um, and so I just want to make sure people have a sense that this truly, this is where it gets down to the my perspective from the Institute for Local Self Reliance. We want to have the right entities building these networks because they are more likely to make that decision in a way that, that is going to be good for the community than than what's going to be best for the the bottom line. Um, well, so. and, and we and we got turned down for a cable TV franchise application by the city of Minneapolis, and we fought hard for it, and we couldn't get one because we didn't. It was kind of a chicken and egg thing. Is your network built? No. Well, then you can't have it. Well, you have to 100% build your network to get it. It's like, well, okay, that's going to take 10 years, but yeah. you let Century you let CenturyLink have one. Yeah, but they have the wherewithal to indemnify us in court and you potentially don't. So therefore, we're going to give CenturyLink a cable franchise agreement and we're going to not give you one. Well, the dirty little secret is thank God they didn't because <laughs> who the hell wants to do linear television anymore across your network? So even though it's our plan to build out the entire network, some of the areas that are challenging on the ROI, we will we will have to build them slower. You know, we, we're going to have to just take a five year window and pick off one fifth every year to build mm -hmm. it. Other, otherwise, I simply can't make the debt work. Right. No, I and think that's, it, that's it, a, it, yeah, yeah. Those are good. And we, points, we, yeah. And we, and we don't qualify for any of the government. Uh, what's the technical term? The handouts, the grants. I believe, or I believe they, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. handouts is good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they got, we don't qualify <laughs> for the government handouts. So therefore, you know, we're, we're, it's on. We're on our own to do it. I would like to see you carry a check from the federal government into uh, your the bank that you use, Travis, and try to deposit a five billion dollar check. <laughs> you know, I'd like to see the. I'd like to see the forms. I, I admire Monica for navigating through all the quagmire of that kind of stuff. You know, the seven thousand form document you have to fill out to to get your first dollar. No thanks. But Monica, I think you were going to come yeah. back to other um, challenges, and I I just wanted to, I wanted to run down that quick to because I think people have a lot of questions about some of these with what are the where the law is. Uh, so anyway. Yeah, and that's an area that you know I think it needs some work. It needs a lot of work. Um, and as I said, it's nuanced because if if we come into a community and AT and T's already built out a neighborhood with fiber, it's going to be difficult for us to build that to justify building that neighborhood. But AT and T should have just built the whole community, um, or or not at all. Said you know as, you know, and I see these incumbents going into communities and taking a a a, a footprint you know, 25 to 50% and then, and then moving on to the next community and doing this regularly with fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, so the other thing is right of way access. And I think what I would say here is a lot of the local ordinances and regulations were written at a time when there weren't, there wasn't a lot in the right of way, be it the aerial right of way, the underground right of way. Today, poles are overcrowded to the point of, you know, you have to replace a pole, most poles to get access in, in many you know, dense urban areas, uh, right of ways are very crowded or and very expensive to access. And so if you want a fiber build out, there needs to be, uh, we, we need to rethink how we're able to access the right of way, uh, you know, how we can make it more accessible for people putting in fiber. You know, there are, there are all sorts of rules, some of which are archaic and don't make sense uh, about where you can and can't go. Um, and it's, 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 we just, we find that utilities are more in conflict. Uh, there needs to be more preemptive regulation around, you know, is there a poles, model that you like? Intensive polls and things like that. Yeah. I mean, do you have any suggestions? Is there some place that got it right? 
Uh, well, I, I think that newer communities are getting it right. Although uh, what I do see, what I do see with them is sometimes they're trying to compress the width of the right of way. And I think that it's, you, you need as much right of way, just not for today, but think about it for decades to come. Um, so, you know, I, we see it's, it's an easier thing for us to do in newer communities, but that's partly because everything's new and things have been done efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, AT&T hasn't taken up four different spots in the right of way. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that really or, happens. Or I'm just guessing. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's, it's polls where, uh, you know, the incumbents have just loaded on and loaded on and loaded on and loaded on as, as we need more cable for more bandwidth from, you know, both the telecom and the cable incumbent. And, you know, there's been no requirement to put up a more robust poll. And so suddenly the last, you know, the, 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 the fiber disruptor is expected to pay for an entirely new poll and for everyone to move their attachments. That's not really feasible. Doug, you I've, 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 looked at, I've looked at communities where the make ready is half the cost of the aerial build. I mean, some, some, some cities, yeah. the polls are so miserable that that stops you. It's at, at, at that point, it's usually cheaper to bury. So. Okay, so yeah. it seems to me we've I've I've very slyly this is just masterful on my part. I've navigated <laughs> us to the point where the obvious solution would be a common fiber fabric touching everyone that is open to multiple competitors, um, or or a conduit approach like uh, West Des Moines is using. Um, so. Uh, what are the what are the gotchas here aside from let's just pretend that ooh, that ooh, local ooh, leaders want to want to actually put in the money to do it? So I thought you'd be the first to make an argument based on physical stuff, Travis. No, no, I want to ask Monica. Take West Des Moines, so it's this fancy open conduit system that we can all use. But Google's the first one to come in there. <laughs> I love this. Are question. you guys going to go in there? <laughs> I'm no. not. Hell no. no, not in a not in a thousand years. So. Really, it's a shared conduit system with one provider, at least. Okay, so, so I was curious what Monica's perception was of that. No, but let me ask you this. I mean, let's, so let's just say, like, let's say that in 10 years, Google is miserable and people hate it as much as they hate uh, Charter Spectrum or AT&T today. Would you go in then? Yeah, I think you would. Let's give well, it I don't know, time. but I mean, I mean 10, <laughs> but, but what kind, who's going to build their business on maybe in 10 years, something's going to happen. You know, you, I, I would... I, I, I'm just saying, I don't think it is a, as much a shared network as maybe you do. Um, because when you put a big, you know, what do they call 10,000 pound gorilla in there to begin with, none of us little guys are going to roll in yeah. after it. No, I'll take that yeah. point. I think that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was my observation too. I don't see that business plan working. I'll be pleasantly surprised if it does. Well, in the meantime, well, let's just put it, let's be clear. It let's what it will do, and tell me if I'm wrong on this. What it will do is it will bring in one new provider named Google um, to compete everywhere. Uh, it will it will leverage um, it'll it'll basically get rid of a bunch of headaches in rights of way in other places where um, you know whether it's Verizon or T-Mobile or whoever building small cells will be able to use that conduit and probably will and save money. Um, I, I one of the things I'd be excited about would be that now that you have the conduit there, you have a health provider that wants to start doing some interesting pilot projects. It's suddenly affordable. I think the city wants to do a lifeline type approach. Now they have an option for doing that at a fairly low cost. Am I am I just way to my imaginary land well the bottom line though is the city has to be prepared that they simply invested that money and they're never going to see any of it back because yeah. the, you know the west of morning business plan probably showed they needed six or seven providers in there to get their money back and they're not going to get them so as long as the community is willing to make that investment in the fiber and just call it infrastructure like streets then then all those benefits you said are there in the long run all those little niche plays will show up I don't think you. I don't think you'll get a second citywide ISP, as Travis says. But I. But I think you'll get all those little niche players over time, and so oh, you yeah. know. Yeah. But that that's yeah. still that's still not the kind of competition they envision, though. They envision head-to-head -head fork fiber guys, and that's just never going to happen. So. And you got Verizon, AT and T. They build their own networks, so they'll just build right over the top of just like they did, <laughs> just like they did here. I mean, there's plenty of conduit they could have leased, and they ran their own because that's their model. They want to control their network. Yeah. Because remember, the, remember, remember, T-Mobile has been riding on Zao for years, and they're getting out of it. 
Right. They, yeah, they don't. They're, they're they're not looking to share with somebody. Well, else. I mean, I'll just say that I've seen a lot of companies doing this in Lincoln, where they seem to be using that. I it, I think it's harder in a place like Minneapolis, where you have conduit in what ten percent of the city, versus if you have conduit everywhere, it might be easier to sign a master agreement because you know it, you're it, yeah. you don't want to be doing half and half. I'm guessing, right? I mean, that's the danger right. zone. Yeah, and and I don't I don't necessarily want to you know, throw shade on the West Des Moines model, but I do want to go back to, to Doug's point about managing expectations with local governments. Uh, we do run into local governments that have been, you know, told, um, you know, you'll, cost recovery will happen. Maybe you'll even make some money on your investment in a fiber backbone or a conduit system. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm constantly trying to say to municipalities, uh, look, you may, you may not. You need to be prepared to may not because right. municipalities are risk averse. You need to plan that you are investing in infrastructure, as Doug said, like roads. And, you know, anything you get back is gravy, but, but don't count on it. Yeah, no, I think that's that's the right message. Uh, there's a question discussion in the chat about um, uh, people like Layer Zero. Uh, question of Stockholm, what did they get right? Um, if I had to guess, um, and you can react to this, you know, it's the difference between the gorilla or not. I mean, you're not saying just any old fiber ISP. You're saying if it's a massive ISP, why would you go to West Des Moines? But if if Travis launched in West Des Moines and he was the anchor tenant, would another ISP feel confident sure. going in there? Yeah, because I don't control YouTube, YouTube TV, all these services that we rely on, and we rely on peering arrangements and caching servers and all these things from Google. You don't, yeah, you, you don't, you don't want to compete with your content. So, go ahead, Trent, Doug. No, I, his point was so good, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So then, what is this issue then? I mean, if a if a city was to build open access, then is the goal to basically find a trustworthy ISP, but just one that's not so big to be an anchor? Because I think a lot of us have believed that having an anchor was important to making a program like this. Yeah, I, I, oh. I would have I found the local guy in Des Moines. You know, I would have found the Ting of Des Moines and worked with them to come and provide service. And there are, and there are, and there are some good local ISPs. Yeah. I've been very surprised by that myself. You know, we can't compare to Europe. In Europe, when they build an open access network, they get the equivalent of AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, Charter, and CenturyLink all showing up on the network together, and they compete head to head. That's a different model. We don't. They get five gorillas, and they beat the hell out of each other. And they also end up getting 95% of the people in the city using that fiber network, and that pays for the network. The people, you know, Amsterdam and the Paris networks are the actual cities making a lot of money on them because everybody on the city's on it. It doesn't happen here. Mm. And so, the, you know, we don't get five of those guys showing up. We don't even get one of them. You know, it's one thing to say Google is a gorilla, but they're not the incumbent. You know, why isn't CenturyLink, or why isn't Charter moving over to these free, why aren't they going to be on the West Des Moines network? They're not going to even think about it. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's yeah, no, and I don't, I mean, I fundamentally, I, I feel like these yeah. networks should be open to those providers, but I don't. Well, they are open to them, but they're right. not interested. Right. right. But I'm yes. also glad about that is what I'm <laughs> saying, because I don't want to, I, I, I mean, I actually think it's irrelevant in the sense that if we get to a situation in which there's a lot of competition, Charter and Comcast will crumble because they cannot, they will not succeed in a very competitive environment. Their business model is based on being a monopoly and treating people like dirt and them not being able to go away. Uh, so, so, I mean, I want to see smaller ISPs like these ones and even smaller ones to be the ones getting up and thriving. I love, this they, panel. I love this panel because I don't have to say all the bad things about the cable. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't Des Moines need Google though to fund it? Doesn't it come full circle back? Well, no, what happened is, I mean, that? this is, I, I feel like my understanding of it is more that Des Moines was moving forward with this and Google said, do it fast and we'll pay you. <laughs> So okay. that's the way yeah. I would translate it. And and Des Moines said, yeah, that makes sense. And in part, Des Moines had something that I would like to see in more communities, which is that, you know, I feel like, Monica, you go into a community, you've had these conversations. 
I feel like we need local leaders who are more willing to say, damn it, I want you to serve everyone. Because what I get the sense is that you go into communities and I'm not going to say they roll over for you because you have to have hard conversations all the time, I'm sure. But but they're not holding your feet to the fire to demand, or at least not your rivals that they build out further. And in West Des Moines, they were saying, we want to connect everyone. We want to touch everyone. And so it's just, they got that part right, I think. Um, I want to reserve a couple of minutes to just uh, move on. Um, but is there any last comments before we do? So uh, anyone excited about the elections tomorrow? Um, I don't want to talk about uh, the presidency or the U.S. Senate, but, you know, Chicago's voting on whether or not the city should make an active effort to deal with the digital divide. Uh, Denver, several other cities are voting on municipal broadband. Kaysville, Utah, I mean, voting on building one of these open systems that won't have a 900 pound gorilla in it. Um, it's going to be some interesting stuff going on tomorrow. I'm just curious if y'all are following anything or, or if there's implications for broadband that you're, you want to share. Well, the biggest implications, there's two big implications for broadband. You know, if the country turns blue, we get a new FCC, and that's always a drastic change. This, this, current, I, this current FCC has been about as pro-large company as is possible. They've given everything away to the large ISPs. And if that reverses, um, that, you know, there's a dozen changes that come flying out of that. But it's not easy to do that. This current ISP really poison the water Current on that neutrality right. to the point where it might take four years to reverse what they did. And so it's not, nothing's going to happen really fast. My biggest fear, that you're going to laugh at this one, my biggest fear is that they're going to do an infrastructure project and go, here's $200 billion for rural fiber, build it next year. There's, there's no shovel ready projects ready anywhere. <clears throat> and, and there's no ISPs ready to do that. You go to places like West Virginia where there literally is no ISPs ready to do that. And they're, they're, I hope that they take some common sense time if they're going to really throw money at fiber to do it right. If they do it poorly, it's going to be an absolute disaster. So, And I, and I think that there's a real chance that in their, in their wanting to do great things that they're just going to go, let's just solve this problem. Boom. And they will not solve the problem. Well, the, yeah, the danger may even just be, let's make it look like we've solved this problem. Right. <laughs> right. That, that's my fear. So yeah. Monica, so. any, any thoughts on the election tomorrow? <laughs> sure. As a resident Canadian. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I would, I would echo Doug's thoughts and, you know, that's what we saw with the CARES Act funding, right. Which is great intentions, but broadband projects had to be, customers had to be, lit by the end of this year, which is, you know, for, for a, a governmental entity to turn around funding and a project that quickly was, is very, very difficult. So I agree. I hope that if there is funding, you know, if we, if you do end up with a democratic administration and there is funding put towards it, that that happens. I, I am hopeful regardless though, uh, of the, of the, the you're the one the, of the result. I know this because the pandemic forced visibility into the, I think the criticality of the digital divide in the U S um, you know, it, it, for the last two decades, all of the regulation has really been done under the thumb of the incumbents. And I think now they're being, their feet are being held to the fire a little bit because their constituents have been uh, so disadvantaged by the lack of connectivity during the pandemic. So I think that this problem is going to be uh, somewhat better regardless of who wins the, the presidential race. But I think, you know, certainly if it's a democratic administration, Yes, we get a change in the FCC, and uh, probability says it would be uh, more pro-consumer. Well, and, and I just want to, for Travis talks here. I work I don't in want rural communities. All, I work in rural <laughs> communities all over the place, and the mood has completely swung because of COVID. People were really wanting broadband last year. Now it's a demand. Yeah. I mean, you, you need to go to these rural communities, and you don't want to go to those public meetings if you're an official if you don't have a solution. I mean, it's getting kind of ugly out there. So, yeah. Travis? Uh, I would just hope that one of these administrations will open up the uh, government funding and programs to include major metropolitan markets. I'm so glad that, you said that because that, this that's, is, yeah. Yeah, let me, let me, that's, so this is my dream, right? Would be to say, you know, the art off is just completed. We're going to pause on, on rural funding briefly. Well, we're going to get the really good maps and we're going to come back to figure out how to really address that. In the meantime, we're going to go after urban areas in which we know there's very low take up. We're going to build 
the, we're going to significantly do a heavy match to local money to build open access fiber or conduit projects, but those sorts of things to lower the barriers for ISPs to get into them. Um, that's my dream. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, w I wanted to, I was hoping for a program similar to like the opportunity zones where there was these demographic areas where people could deploy capital and had incentives. And I would like, I'd like to see the same thing because there's a lot of good we could do here in the city uh, specifically Minneapolis and St. Paul, but there's only so much I can do on my own, you know, cause I've mm -hmm. got to maintain financial viability. And, um, you know, I, I think having that ability either from a state or a federal level would really, and not just from the internet connectivity standpoint, because as we alluded to in the last conversation, just the getting technology into people's hands, it doesn't do them any good if you have connectivity. Um, but we got to have give, give them a computer or something to work with. Well, and, and there is the big scary statistic. 750,000 kids in New York City didn't have home broadband during the COVID. Yep. The numbers are so mind boggling large. That's more people, that's more kids than are in four or five states total population. So we can't just throw the money at the rural areas. We have to solve this. So, so, yeah. so Chris, can, 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 can I ask these two the same question of what we consider appropriate broadband? Sure. Because I, I, I really want to, I want to champion that on this our cause here because yeah. So we're, we're, we are running out of time, but yeah, oh, I think you sorry, should, I think, we... no, I think you should ask that question. I think we so, should so, so, that. so Monica, as a, as a goal, as just societal goal, what should be our minimum benchmark that you think for broad, the definition of broadband? I'm just curious what you think it should be. I mean, I would, I would love to see it at 50 and I would, I, I most importantly want to see it symmetrical. Okay. Uh, but I, you know, I would be happy with 25 symmetrical. Doug, what do you think? I, I'm thinking it should be 25, 50, I mean, 250, 50. I, I don't think if, if you're going to invest today and it takes 10 years to pay off those investments, it has to be good broadband at the end of those 10 years. So I think investing money in, in anything below 250 megabits is a waste of time. So. All right, that, doesn't, so I, that doesn't leave too many options. <laughs> so, so, all right. So I will be the lone champion of gigabit symmetrical should be our minimum at some yes. point. Well, it was invent, it was my, invented my goal was the same thing because you can't beat my goal without fiber. So. Well, it's, 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 right. it's, I, look at, I look at this, this. This technology was invented in, what, June 1998, right? And here we are, what, 20, Only 20 years, 20, 22 years later, and we're still talking about you know, 25, 50, 100, whatever the case I may be. I, I mean, I, it's, I feel like we're building dirt roads when we should be building highways. Yes. I, I, the other piece of it, I feel like as a, as a more fiscally conservative than anyone thinks about me, um, I just hate the idea of building stuff and then having to subsidize those same households again. Oh right. yeah. You build it over. So I want to end with one other piece of this, which is um, Michael McCarthy um, asks about uh, planning and, uh, and local leadership. This is to me, I think, I think money is a huge issue, but from my perspective of wanting communities to be more involved in this and to drive some of this, I'm disappointed in the lack of leadership. I'd really like to see small amounts of money go to matching grants for planning purposes, getting local plans together. North Carolina is doing that well with the, the band grants, Doug. Um, and I just want to get a quick sense from Doug and Monica in particular. Is there is there an important role for state or federal money to just force local planning on this? Yeah, I, th you know, the, I call that developmental capital, the feasibility study, the engineering, the business planning, somebody's got to pay for that up front. But actually, and I think so I think that states and, 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 you know, a training of officials, it's more than just the feasibility. Study. That's the part, I, yeah, I think yeah. I think states need to fill that role because you can't get it with private money. Nobody fills that role on the private side. So it has to be either a nonprofit like like Blandon's doing in Minnesota, or it's got to be the government. There's really only two places to get it. So, mm -hmm. Monica, you know, I, I think I have I, I have a slightly colored view because of my experience in Massachusetts, where uh, you know the state government just couldn't get out of the way of the local communities trying to do things properly. Um, but you won. Let's just be clear: the state messed it up and messed it up, but they came back and got it. They got it okay. They didn't they got it perfect. okay. They still made yeah. it highly inefficient. Like every single town had to do it on their own, which you know it's sort of opposite to this business principle called scale. But <laughs> aside from that, um, <laughs> one, one thing that I, you know, that was, that was really fundamental to our ability, like the Wired West group's ability to be, be the subject matter experts is I, you know, we made every single town 
uh, put two people on the board and then it was 45 to, so it was not, we had a pool of 90 people and we ran around and we picked people that were subject matter experts in, in the law. You know, we had someone that had gone to Harvard Law School in finance. We had someone who worked for in finance for Bank of America, in marketing, in uh, te- in the technology side, on uh, the phone side, and 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 then you know we had a, we had two community liaisons, and that meant that we were good. You know, uh, the comment was made earlier about these small ISPs not being good at all these aspects. We were good at everything, and I feel like developing local a, a group that is incentivized and has the right skills is really fundamental to the success as much as all these other things are also important having cost us esti- like high level cost estimates and high level engineering and and, and and having that technical data and having the market research studies d- done you do need the expertise as well smart i like that so I want to thank you all. This has been a it's been a really fun conversation. Um, I'm looking forward to figuring out uh, what we'll talk about next week. I don't have any anything to cherry pick from Travis's comments to immediately build a show around, maybe just around how excited we are that, that we have change or that we don't have change, um, depending on the results tomorrow. Um, my goal is to figure out how to light my neck better to see if I can make it any brighter for this white pallor that I have. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, but I think a, a big milestone, Chris, before you go. 10 users watching oh no we we peaked even higher than that and we we had 37 playbacks yeah um i've i've really had fun i feel like this is a it's a heck of a conversation i think we need um i think we need to do keep doing these sorts of things because i don't know doug doug monica like you guys are looking around to try and get this stuff no one's talking like this i feel like i mean that's just my impression well, unfortunately, there are too many places where talking heads talk, and none of them are experts. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, this is this is a good, for good people here. So, yep. So. Yeah, reality checks are needed at yeah. all levels of this space. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you all, and uh, we'll be in touch to have you back on future shows. All right. Thank, thank you.